Special thanks to Herman Marshall and their handcrafted award-winning small batch whiskey for being such a great partner with Suds with Luds and our Dub Network. Uh, another episode here of Suds with Luds on the Dub Network. Today is a another uh, a special one. We're going back in time a little bit. Um, this gentleman has done everything when it comes to coaching, and uh, Hitch, you're still a you're still a big figure here in Dallas. And uh, so, anyway, welcome to Ken Hitch Hitchcock, our Stanley Cup champion coach from 1999. Hitch, how are you doing to start off with? Buds, I'm doing well. Are you keeping yourself busy, as busy as you need to? Uh, I would say uh, yes, not not from a physical standpoint. I, in other words, I'm not a, attending games. I, I go to a few American League games here. Uh, Dallas's Farm Club was here over the weekend, but I, I do a lot of it by symposiums by zoom uh, i'm really constant with the the blues uh, i work with the coaching staff kind of on a post-game basis and then i work with the american league team every tuesday uh so i stay busy enough but I, I i'm not out there traveling around which i really appreciate i i get tired of the traveling luds and and so being i, I spend half my time here in uh, palm springs and the other half in uh in Kelowna and I like it like that. So you've got uh, plenty of time to work on your golf game then is what you're saying. And it gets worse every year. So <laughs> I seem to hit it shorter and hit it worse. So well, I enjoy it. it's a great club and there's a lot of sports people that are at the club and it's a, it's a great place because it's just a golf club. It's, there's no country club part of it. Now and, is, uh, is Ralphie well, in Palm Springs too? Where's Ralphie yeah. at? He's, he's in actually downtown Palm Springs. So okay. we're about 40 minutes away. Yeah, I had trip. Ralphie Ralphie come on a few months ago, and he seems to be into uh, pickleball. Like, he loves that pickleball now. And he's involved in the uh, um, in the uh, visual part of, uh, of, of entertainment. He's, he's, got, he's got stuff going on the entertainment side of things, too. Yeah, he's al he's always found a way to, way to keep busy, and, and I know he loves doing all that kind of stuff. Hitch, you have done... I mean, you've been you've been doing this since God was a cowboy. So you you have done just about everything. I mean, you're number number four in all time wins in the NHL. Um, you know, I, I look at the things. I mean, again, Stanley Cup and Jack Adams, three Olympic gold medals, World Cup hockey championship, junior championship, a couple WHL titles, coach of the year. You were honored by the order of, and explain this to me, Hitch. The order with the the order of hockey in Canada. Well, I mean, I don't. I'm I'm guessing there's no higher award uh, award in Canada, but can you explain what that is? Uh, it's an award that uh, um, you 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 have to uh, accomplish by winning. Obviously, that's number one. But number two is growing the game. And uh, I took it upon myself uh, I, with the information that I was getting through symposiums and working with guys like Bob Ganey, Rick Wilson, Doug Jarvis. I, I passed that information on. So I, I provided information to people, Luds, but, but also I won. I was involved in championships. And uh, so I, I had good luck and I ended up getting an award because of it, because it's, it's very prestigious and I was really honored by it. And, um, you know, I, I feel for a guy coming from minor hockey, like I, I'm grassroots. I, I came up from mite hockey, coaching Bantam and midget hockey, and then all the way up to the NHL. So I've grassrooted it all the way up here and I'm really proud of that. So y your first pro gig was in Kalamazoo, right? Yeah, as a head coach. Yeah, uh, as a head coach, but... And then uh, I was two and a half years in Kalamazoo and then c came with you guys to, um, to Dallas. So, Madrasas. but you started in Philly as an assistant, correct? That was your for first as yeah, assistant job, but the head job was in Kalamazoo. Yeah. What was it like stepping 
into Philly as an assistant, getting your first taste of the NHL? Bizarre. Really bizarre for me. I, I, I was used to one thing in junior, and if you look at our junior record, we were in first place five or six years that I was the coach there, and I was just used to everything done to perfection. And Philly was in a rebuild or reboot or whatever you want, and it was chaos. It was, it was tough because the players were just starting to grow, and we didn't have a very good team. And at the end of the second year, Luds, that's when we traded all those players for, for Eric. Mm -hmm. And so we went from, we got to a certain level after year two and then crashed and burned because w once we got Eric, it took three years to grow it back again. So has it crashed? Has it kind of come full cycle, <laughs> full circle right where they're at now? Well, it's a good lesson for everybody in hockey because um, I don't know that there is anything that you do uh, it takes a special general manager to re reboot an organization. There's lots of rebuilds that go on, but I don't think the hockey fan and the season ticket holder has time for a rebuild because it's three years minimum. And I don't think there's very many fan bases that can handle that. So you're constantly trying to reboot it. And sometimes it works and sometimes it did it. When Clarkie rebooted it, when I was there, we took off. When I went back there as a head coach after I was in Dallas, he, reboot, he rebooted the organization and we took off for five years. But after it crashed again, it's been hard to come back. So then when, well, then what would you, what would you consider when, when we moved from Minnesota to Dallas? I mean, I, I know that was a relocation. I mean, he didn't mention that, but I mean, no. we were kind of in a, I mean, we had a team, you know, that was in Minnesota was kind of, I, I remember Bob and we'll talk about Bob Ganey here in a little bit. And, and you mentioned Jarvie and, and Wills, but I remember Bo when we were here and he made a comment to me at one point and he just said his phrase to me, and you know how he, he kind of speaks in, in, in code sometimes. And he goes, Oh, we just got a bunch of 500 guys. And I, and I really wasn't sure what he meant by that at the time, but it was players that he felt were win one, lose one. And it was okay. Yeah. Hey, Luds, when I went to Dallas in January of 96, he said, I need a coach. He said, I don't have time for it. Uh, I've got lots of things going on in my personal life, and I've got to fix the hockey club from a manager standpoint. Within a week when I got there, he unloaded a bunch of guys, mm -hmm. and we went into a rebuild. What we were lucky with and really got fortunate with was that we had player-ready performers that were in Kalamazoo, Matt Fachuk, Lagenburner, players like that, that could come in and help us right away. So we went from what was going to be a rebuild to a reboot to winning the, the division championship that next year. And it was because we had the players in Kalamazoo that were ready to play. And, uh, and that, that, uh, that sped up everything. But that's a very unique situation and doesn't happen very often. Yeah, and I would say that the fans were, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say a little more forgiving. I, I, they really didn't know what the sport was about, you know, uh, for the most part. So I, I think they were, I, I think they were pleasantly surprised. I think the physical side of things at the time when we first got started was appealing to them. Um, I remember when, <laughs> when guys like Shane Turla, they were the most popular players. And I'm kind of talking to people when you're out, and I'm like, there is this guy by the name of Mike Madonna on our team. And it, it took him a while to figure out who Mo was, but then all of a sudden Mo took off. But I think we looked at it. You know, they say you never get a, a second chance to make a first impression. And, and I think it kind of was for us because we came to a market that really didn't know anything about it. And, and we, we got to endear ourselves, I think, in a way to the fans here in Dallas. And I'm sure you felt that way as a coach also. Well, the fans loved the grit of the team. They loved the personality of the players. It was just a, a perfect hook. You know, the, the, the players played, we played a tough brand. It was a fair brand, but it was tough. And we had a lot of gritty guys. And we had a lot of guys that had some zip in their personality. They weren't afraid to express their opinion. And the fan base loved that. And it became the go-to place, Reunion Arena, and that white tent became <laughs> the go-to place yeah. in, in in all of Texas. And and it was the personality of the players, and it was their competitiveness. And, and I've always said this about people in Texas. 
because I play golf with a bunch of Texans and they're the most competitive people I've ever seen in my life. And you can't fool them. You, you, they may not know the sport intimately, but they know competition and you can't fool them. And when they saw the way we competed, they really latched on. Yeah. I, I think you nailed it there. I mean, we're, we're still seeing it and hearing it and they're, you know, they're very loyal and you know how it is for football here. And I think the, the hockey side of people have, they, they've caught up to that. And, um, Let's. You mentioned a couple guys, and obviously Bob Gainey, uh, and there's some guys that have kind of been in your in your life in your hockey life um, consistently. Doug Armstrong was here. Um, now you, you know you're working with St. Louis, and you're you're a coach consultant, which we can get a little bit into that. But let's start with Bob. What did did you know Bob prior to Kalamazoo, or was no. it, I mean, did you know him in Philly when you were there at all? No, Lutz. Here's how it worked. At, I had three days left of my contract with Philadelphia and, and then I, a scouting clause was going to kick in. So if I couldn't get a job, I was going to be a scout. Les Jackson called on the last day, uh, who was Bob's assistant, and said, Bob would like to interview you for the job. I flew into Minnesota. I bought a brand new pair of shoes <laughs> and we walked around this lake three times in, near the airport. I just about killed my feet. I got back on the plane, and then two days later, he, he called me and said, you got the job. I never knew Bob. I never knew. I knew of him, obviously, but I never knew him personally, and I'd never met him. And that walk along around the lake uh, solidified everything, and we became a partnership. But Doug, Doug was my boss from the day I arrived in Kalamazoo until I finished in Dallas and then came back on in fold in 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 uh, St. Louis. And so Doug and I have been together for almost 20 years with him being my boss. And, uh, and it was that combination of Bob Ganey, Les Jackson, Craig Button was involved in this. Uh, and then, uh, and then Doug and obviously Rick and, and Jarvie. Well, didn't, 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 uh, didn't army fire you a couple times? A good, good buddy, Doug Armstrong. <laughs> he fired me in St. Louis, but I probably deserved it, Lutz. <laughs> <laughs> no coaches ever admit that. I want to know, give me your first impressions. You, you talk about walking around the lake with Bo. I mean, I remember when I was sitting on a plane uh, as a rookie, I believe it was, in Montreal, and Bob had had me come back in his seat, and we were talking about um, a penalty killing or something like that. And, you know, and again, you're talking to the cap captain of the Montreal Canadiens. But what was your first impression? Because Bob has a, he has a different way of communicating, you know, and, and just – did anything pop out at you at the time going, what the hell am I getting into here? Or, or did everything just make sense at the time you guys are on your little walk? Luds, I've said this to people before. The first time I met Bob Ganey, when I got back on the plane to come to, to fly back to Kalamazoo, I said, I, I'm not quite sure, but I think I met a man that sees around corners. Mm -hmm. And I said, he saw things that would happen well ahead of time. He knew how it would turn out. And sometimes he'd let you sink or swim with it. And sometimes you had to figure it out for yourself, but he'd guide you in a big picture way, but he knew where it was going to go way before it went. And I was just amazed by that. And he's just, he's got this ability to see where incidents or actions will take us to. And that's what made us such a good pair is I fought the daily fight and he took care of the big picture. Yeah, he he always, I, I, like that, that conversation I was talking about. It, it was like he was he was testing you, and and he would. I remember him asking me about the penalty kill, and I had to draw it on a little piece of paper sitting on the plane, and and I showed it to him, and he picked up the paper and he looked at it very slowly, and then he looked at me, he looked back at the paper, he looked at me again, and I was kind of getting a little uncomfortable, and. And he just kind of shakes his head and he goes, no, no, because he wanted to get my opinion on, on how we were killing. And but I think Bob Ganey was one of those guys that's always teaching and, and he has different ways of doing it and getting you engaged in the game and, and things like that. Um, I remember the time Hitch and, and where we, he was asking us about um, the team that we were playing the next night and wanted to know who was their leading goal scorer, who had scored in their in their previous game. And how many shots did they have on that? It was always at the end of practice. And he'd ask these kind of questions. And we had no clue. What, you know, we didn't know who the hell scored the goals and who was the leading this and that at the time. And what happened is it happened again and again and again. Next thing you knew, our trainers all had the 
the the papers in our in our locker rooms on the the day before the morning and so we could we'd pass the papers around and we were starting to you know learn all that kind of stuff because we didn't know who he was going to call on next when we got out there on the ice and so anyway but he got you engaged you know prior to playing the game and I think that's kind of his mo I, I just I've always said about Bo is he he's twenty four seven hockey I mean he, he doesn't have an off switch on him and and it's what he was put here to do and he's done an incredible job um, you also mentioned earlier assistant coaches and I know you had Rick Wilson and Doug Jarvis and I, I want to get from you and, and I'm sure all head coaches feel the same way about their assistants but you all go about your businesses sometimes a little bit differently how important are those guys the assistants the guys kind of behind the scene well I'll tell you this um, I started as a head coach I lived in Edmonton Alberta I started as a head coach following the University of Alberta Golden Bears and the Edmonton Oilers. And they both, the Oilers adopted their style of play that, that Gretzky and everybody performed in Messier, performed under by following the Alberta Golden Bears. And it was a full court press. Uh, and it's back in vogue now. But I brought that system to Kalamazoo and we ate up the International Hockey League with it. And I took it to Dallas and I put the system in place from January until April, my first year, 96. And we got beat up bad. And I, Bob said to me at the end of the year, he said, uh, do you want to keep your assistant coaches or, or what do you want to do? Because you, you, you know, we, we didn't give you a choice when you came in. I said, no, I, I just started to get to know Rick and Doug who've become great friends. Um, I said, no, I'll, I'll stay with it. He said, well, then you're going to have to listen to these guys because they got way more experience than you do. And you're, and at the end of the season, we sat down, Luds, and we changed our system completely. And I followed exactly what Rick and Doug put in, in force that they'd played under that type of play in Montreal. And we followed that system to a T, um, for a long, long time, and it was a complete 360 from what I had been teaching, and they taught me how to adapt and fit the system to the personnel. We weren't the quickest team. You know, yeah, we had Medano and, and a couple other guys, but we, we were positionally sound and really smart, and we had to kind of play a patient game. These, the term everybody used to call was death by a thousand cuts, and that's the way we played. And Rick uh, Wilson and Doug Jarvis brought it on the table, planted it, and then we grew it from there. So that leads me into a couple other things that I wanted to ask you about, and, and it does have to do with systems. Um, I, I guess what it – my question is from that standpoint, as a coach and you're being interviewed, you're being interviewed by whether it's Ganey or you know Poyle or whoever it may be, and when they ask you what kind of system that you want to play, how does it work from a standpoint of having the right players for that particular system? Do they dictate to you, these are the kind of players that we have here, how are you going to change those players? Or if you say, here's what works for me, here's what I believe the way that we need to play, do they go out and make the moves? How does that work from, from a head coach in a general manner, especially in the interview process? Well, the coaches that are successful put a system in place that fits the personnel and, and the mental attitude of the team. There are some teams that can play a very structured system, and there's some teams where you've got to turn two loose and, and let three read off of two or, or turn three loose and let two read off of it. Sometimes you've got people who can really – who just you, they come in, they've got great sticks – they got great angles. Uh, their their way of playing the game, they're great on the boards. Uh, they're able to win the board battles, everything like that. They're a heavy team. And you can play a heavy system, and it works. Some teams need to play where there's less thinking involved. Just go. Read, react, go. And I came from a read, react, go system, and you need real foot speed for that. And if you get caught halfway, you're dead. And uh, we were getting caught halfway and it was going nowhere. And we made a complete change to a very um, 
meticulous, patient, um, a kind of uh, control the game uh, from a layered standpoint. Basically, what I'm saying is we we M Montreal Canadiens play a layered four checking system, a layered set of defense and a layered checking system. And you had to be really smart to play that way. And Rick and Doug felt we had the personnel to play that way and we put it in place. And that's why things turn so quickly. We go from last place and and a week into the season, we're in first place the next year and we never left. And we, we were in first place for five and six years. And it was because the, the style that we put in place fit the personnel and it worked like a glove. Well, so when you mentioned, I mean, you mentioned Wills played in Montreal, Jarvey played in Montreal, Ganey was Montreal. Is is that the reason that, I mean, I, I think of Carbo, Keen, Scrudlin, myself. Is that the reason a lot of players were being traded from Montreal to, to Dallas because that they had played in that system and, and did you guys target players that had that would be able to basically step in and know what we're trying to do here partially but the other reason we traded was bob wanted as many players on the team where hockey was really important to them and their families he wanted that type of player he wanted people who talked the game who who ate slept the game he wanted people who were really dedicated to the game because he felt those people would be able to play at the end of the year and win championships and it, and, and win playoff series. And he wanted people. Uh, I remember Lutz, he came to us and he said, okay, it's trade deadline. What do we need here? And we're sitting there saying, well, we need a second line left wing and we probably need a third line right wing. And if we get those guys, we're going to be really competitive. Well, in walks Screwland and Keene, two fourth line guys. And they both end up playing on the third line when the game matters. He already knew what we needed and he wanted to see how close we were. We were 100 miles away from where he was at. But those two guys brought so much to our hockey club because he knew we needed more serious, competitive, died in the wool type players. So was it his way, do you think, of feeding you those guys even without saying it? And that, that kind of leads me to the other thing I was going to ask. Is, is it typical that general managers, I mean, I think it should be, I would hope it would be, but that when it gets to that trade deadline date, and I, don't, I, I, I love the guys that, that tr make, make moves way before the deadline. It seems like it's, it's a smarter thing to do. But um, do they come to you prior and ask you, are they all like that? Or, or is it more, more the GM? Next thing you know, a player comes walking in the door, you didn't know what the hell was going on. No. Um, now, it, and that was an agreement that I had with Clarkey, with Bob Ganey, with Doug Jarvis, or sorry, Doug Armstrong. They asked me, well, uh, you know, during trade deadline, like, what do you want to know or what's going on? I said, I don't want to know anything other than if you tell me a name from an opposition that you're looking at, then I, I want to tell you where I think he fits in or does he fit in. I don't want to know. I don't want to know who we're trading or who you're thinking about trading. I don't want to ever know that because it's going to affect the way I manage and, and coach that player. So all the time, those guys would say, we've got a chance to get player X. Where does he fit? Or does he fit? Or what do you think of this guy? And then that's who, that was my expertise. I'd go and do my homework. I'd watch five or six games. I'd kind of bird dog and, and ask my friends uh, who I trusted information on and background information. And then I would tell Bob, this is where I think he fits. And Doug, or this is where I think he fits. But I never knew the guy on our side that was going. And I didn't want to know. So didn't, was it Bill Parcells that said, if you want me to cook the meal, I want to be, I want to be able to buy the groceries? Uh, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't agree with that, though. Okay. I don't agree with that at all. And, and, that, and that's why, Lud's because when you sign up to be a coach, there's a difference between being a coach and being a teacher. And when you sign up to be a coach, you're coaching. That means you take what the personnel is there and you get the absolute best of it. Complaining about what it is or asking for more is not coaching. That's somebody that just wants to teach and hopefully he's got the right player. It's your job to inspire and grow them and make sure that they're, they're fascinated and intrigued by wanting to be a member of the team. 
That's your job as a coach. And too many people for me want to instruct and then leave the inspirational stuff to the player's own devices, and it doesn't work that way. So are you the coach that believes in, and I, th- I think that this would be the, the philosophy in, in a bunch of teams, and I think it was in, in Montreal for sure, is I, you, you don't change your coaching style as you're getting closer to the playoffs. You're, you're coaching the team. The team that you're coaching for 82 games is the team that you want heading into the playoffs. Is that correct, or, or do you find that you make a few tweaks as you get you know, 15, 20 games out? I make tweaks every year. I would, I would, at, with 20 games left, maybe 25 left. If I if I felt secure, we were going to get in the playoffs. I would start doing things like um, hard match on purpose to see how we handled it, to see how we handled it going on and off the ice. What was the mood on the bench when you were getting pulled off the ice? Uh, I started, and you remember this. We started to spend an enormous time practicing. Six on five, five on six, stuff like that. Goalie pulled stuff. I would start working on that with probably 20 games left. But pretty much everything was there in place. The only thing that would change is if we were down. I, we practiced a lot of times at practice, uh, and it started when I was in Dallas. We would practice the last five minutes of the game, and both on the winning side and the losing side, and uh, – you know, we'd have a full court press, obviously. We were down a goal. How did we read off of that? And then a 1-2-2 one, a one, two, two, kind of locked the middle if we were up a goal. So we practiced that. But I didn't change the system, but the details within it, I really d- dialed it in with about 20 games left. You you were really big, it felt, that in repetition. You know, like and, and I'm, I mean in, in the core of your game and the, and the meat of what you wanted to be. Like, it seemed like we would do the same drills over and over every day. And what screwed us up more is when you actually went to the board and tried to explain the drill that we were doing. I mean, because we, we seemed to know it, we became robots in a way. And, and I think that's what I would assume. And I, I know that with what I do with our guys and it's, I, and the reason I did it is because we had success is that you don't have to think and you just, you just react, you read and react and, but, but it starts in practice and you just do things over and over. So that it just becomes natural. Yeah, I worked on a series. I used to call it osmosis. I would start every drill um, with zero resistance and then finish the drill. That's why the drills went for a long time. Sometimes when when you were playing, we were running, the drill would last 12 minutes. But it started with zero resistance to full resistance to, to really competitive. And I, I took the drill all the way so that I got the players used to having spatial relationships on the ice first with no contact, then with limited contact, then with full contact. And I, I, I would run it there. And I, you know, remember we used to do a warm up drill um, and it was uh, two on one, two on two, three on two, three on three. Mm-hmm. That lasted 12 minutes and it got the players, it got the tempo so hot uh, and so competitive um, that I think it gave us a real advantage. We, we, we knew how to start coming out of the gate. Like a lot of times we overwhelmed teams in the first 10 minutes of the game. And I think we did that because of the tempo that we practiced at. You know, I wanted to ask you a little later, but since you're talking about all this now, you were inducted into the Alberta Hockey Hall of Fame. And I was listening to uh, part of your speech. Apparently that was, uh, must've been during COVID because it was on the internet, but, but you, you used a, a term or a phrase and it was science of coaching. Is that what this is? Because I was going to ask you, what actually is science of coaching or the coaching science or what, however you worded that? It was more science of winning, Luds. I'm fascinated and still to this day, I've gone to places and been in places. Uh, I followed great teams and uh, I spent a year almost with Andy in, uh, in, in, in during the lockout when I was in... Uh, Philadelphia. I, I spent a lot of time with Tony La Russa when he was with St. Louis. Uh, I've traveled to Europe and spent time with English Premier League team. Uh, one of the best teams I ever followed was the Hungarian national handball team. And I, I, I am fascinated by the science of winning in a team sport. And that's to me being my drive. And I read a lot about that. I listen to a lot about that. Not so much the science of coaching. Like, 
how much can you change? But the coaches that have a lock to me on, on high performance, I want to know why they have it and what, what they what they do to accomplish this and how it works. And like I said, I learned that not the most, but pretty much the most, uh, the, the highest level was when I went in and spent three days with the Hungarian handball team. That was unbelievable. Well, does any of this have to do with, I know you're history buff, and, and you've done some of these Civil War reenactment things, right? So is any of that relatable to coaching? Is that why you do it, or is it just totally separate? Oh, I, it was a connection that I saw people, I wanted to see how people lived the lifestyle at that time. I, I wasn't so much intrigued by the battles and everything like that. I did my part and participated, but I was fascinated by that way of life. And I wanted to know, you know, how people grew up and how they traveled, how they lived. I wanted to know that stuff. And so I became fascinated with, with that that era from basically 1850 to 1870, um, you know, where you bartered for everything, and uh, I wanted to know about that life. Okay, so we we've talked a lot about coaches and general managers, and there's been a coach out there up until recently, um, Barry Trotz. You know, took a year off and needed time to rethink, and I, I think get a, probably pick a team that he wants and where he wants to go. I, I think we all were feeling that way, and a lot of people were feeling like that. But anyway, uh, Nashville's general manager, uh, David Poyle, decides to retire, and Barry Trotz, who has never been a general manager but been a coach like you his entire life, he's the guy in the big chair now is that a big change for a guy and is it something that has ever entered your mind where you know maybe i'd want to be on the other side of that i want to be in the bigger office upstairs no but i knew barry when barry moved back to nashville i knew he was going to get into management um and when i we we talk a lot and when we talk during the summer i him getting let go in the island, I, I was I was listening to a guy, in my opinion, Luds, that I felt was burnt out. And he was taking his time, but when he moved back to Nashville, I knew he wasn't going to come back. And he's fit for that because he grew up at the st with the franchise um, from day one in Nashville. So he's, he's been there and dealing with the business people because all they had to do was market you know, uh, they, they were having trouble winning games. They had to market the personality, and Barry was a personality. So he's comfortable in that chair. I'm, I'm less patient, and I want to be hands-on with the players. And I feel like, uh, I don't want to say that stuff bores me, but um, I don't have the patience for what Barry can do. Barry's a, Barry learned patience because when he came in the NHL, his first 15 years, he wasn't winning very much. And he had to learn patience, and he learned it. And I was lucky. I came in, and I was winning right away. And I, 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 I probably never really had it that much anyways because of where I was in junior and all that. So I, I just think that this is a perfect fit for Barry. He's going to do a great job, and I think he's going to build a real, quick, a real good team real quick. Well, you mentioned the word patience. Um how was your transition as you're going from the old school NHL player to the, to the new generation? It seemed, it takes something. I don't know if it's called patience, but you know, for an old dog, did you have to, did you get it right away? Did you have to change your co coaching tactics more one-on-one -on -one things or team things once this new generation of player starts entering the league? I, I spent a lot of time studying that stuff. I spent a lot of time, trying to figure it out. I, I interviewed people, psychologists, sports psychologists. I came up with two things, Luds, and one I one is a regret, and I wish I would have done it, is um, I pushed players hard because I believed in them, and what I should have done a little more was tell them how much I did believe in them. I felt that they would know because I was pushing and that I, how much I cared, but I think looking back on it, um, I, I probably should have told them more. 
And secondly, which I think is the most important part is th there's a reverse now. So when you deal with players, you have to tell them where they're going before they even start to go there. And whereas when you grew up, it was like fall in line. Here's where you're going. This is, this is the way it's going to be. And now you've got to talk through with the players and talk about the end game before you get to the beginning. And you've got to be patient and you've got to trust that process. And if you're not patient, you won't last. And I see a lot of coaches uh, that don't last because they're, they, they get offended because they have to actually tell the player what's the end game and where it's going to take them to. And, and that's not the way it used to be, but it is that way now. And you've got to really embrace that if you want to be successful. Yeah. I, I'll tell you, I, I remember, you know, and I think they're more visual now than they've ever been. Um, but I remember, you know, you, you draw things up on the board for your team and let's go do the drill and you just skate away and you go do it. And this is where the wingers go, the centermen swing here. And I know when I, you know, I went to Kalamazoo back in 2000, I guess it was, when, when they wanted to make a, a coaching changes there. And, and, and even with our U18 kids now, like you, you show the things, you know, dry, draw it on the, the dry erase board and get ready to go. And there'll still be a couple guys hanging around the board. And <laughs> they want to know why. Like, why do you want me to go over there? You know, and yeah. it's because, and it used to be, well, that's what the coach said. But, but now it's, it's, they just need more input. Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts then? Um, do you have a problem with guys coming back to the bench all the time looking at the iPad? Or is that a good thing for them? Is it a good tool because that's, they just need to see things? Or I always wonder how long you can look at that iPad and not see what's happening as the game's going on. I don't like it. Good, good. <laughs> I don't like it. And I, I don't like it for a di different reason. It's not the coach needs control or anything. It's, it's to me, the, the bench in hockey is the most volatile area in sport. And it takes a lot of talking together, a lot of communicating together. You need to be with each other. Uh, the players need to communicate with each other. And we just go right to video. And you, re you realize that in the NHL, by the time the player, if you play on a Thursday night and you come to the rink on Friday, between watching video before the game, watching your shifts during the game, watching shifts when you get home, and then the coach is waiting for you, four times you've seen your shifts and there's no real talk. Mm -hmm. There's no real talk amongst each other about working together. It's too isolated and it's too separate. And then there's too many opinions that go on. The bench in the successful benches and successful teams have to have a bond of working together while they're playing, but also while they're getting ready to play. And you can't do that when you're staring at a video. 100% agree. And I see it, and I look at it as a distraction at times, but they do what they do. So now in your role now as being a, 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 a coach consultant with St. Louis, do any of those things get shared with head coach Berube and Otter and guys like that? Or what kind of conversations do you, you – or are you more a listener to them? Or, or how do you – what is your role there as a consultant? All, all big picture. So um, – let's say there's a problem in slot coverage. I'll run a series of drills. I'll show them a series of drills that you can process through supply and drills. I don't get into personnel. Uh, I don't get into line combinations. I, I stay out of all that stuff uh, unless they ask. Um, but I, 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 I deal a lot with, uh, Hey, here's, here's a weakness. Here's what you can work on. Here's what I would suggest being a priority, this is the way you can really evolve in this type of uh, system. Um, I know we've had a tough year this year, but we're playing better of late because we changed our system. And we, we got in an agreement that could we, could we get back to read and react and take more, take more thinking out of it? And we did, and we're a much better forechecking team because of it. Those are the discussions we have. And then at the American League level, I talk every Tuesday to the American League coach, uh, Drew Bannister, who's doing a heck of a job there. But we go over uh, the details of, of dealing with 
players. It's more player related. So, you know, he's got your American League, you know what it's like, like some people are happy there, some people aren't happy. How do you do how do you meld it together? How do you keep the team camaraderie going when changes are coming on the big clubs bringing players back and forth? So those are the issues we I deal with Drew on a lot. So when it comes to systems then Hitch, when you're working with your minor league team, are you are they are they playing the the same way that the NHL guys are playing so that if there's an injury and a guy, it's kind of like plug and play or do they, are they developing them more or do you, are they staying on the same page as the big guys? Uh, Lugs, the one area that's on the same page is on track, uh, back checking. Uh, you, you don't want to bring a guy up and, and it's one way at the American league and then another way at the NHL. So it's a, it's a constant. That's the one thing. Now there, each, each team is a little bit different in the way they forecheck in their neutral zone forecheck, but on the back check, the track and reload, both teams play the same way, which helps a young guy when he come, comes up. He's he's not overwhelmed by where should I be, who should I be picking up. He knows exactly what what he has to do. Yeah, I, I think you're you're you know when you're typically coming out of the American League, you're going to replace whoever it may be. It, you're not going to be that player, but at least you have an idea what's happening in the course of the game, and you know where to be, and it gives you a bit of an idea. Let's let's talk about the general manager in St. Louis. Uh, you mentioned Army a little earlier. In my opinion, um, I listened to Army talk. Uh, I've talked to Army. I, I just think I think there's a lot of Bob Gainey in, in Doug. I think he has his own thing, but I think there's probably some things that that Army was able to take away from his his time with Bob. Um, your thoughts on Doug Armstrong as a GM? Because I, I put him in a top two or three in the NHL. Oh, yeah, he's brilliant. He he is Bob Gainey for me. Uh, you know, he's got, he's a little more volatile than, and a little more emotional than Bob. Comes out a little quicker, but he's Bob Gainey. He sees things. He knows where they're going to go. He's not afraid to talk about them. He's Bob Gainey, and, and he's he's learned from one of the best. Uh He's learned from a staff like that, that tree from that staff um, has gone everywhere. You know, uh, the people that Les Jackson's brought on board, Craig Button, that staff's gone everywhere, led by Bob. But Bob, uh, Doug's got his own tree going now, how people that he's helping. So that formula those guys in there i'll bet you there's 20 guys in the national hockey league in management because of those people well i i remember one of the other things that bob had said to me he goes you ever get into the other side of this game surround yourself with good people and and it's obvious that army has no fear of bringing in people nobody's going to take his job and he makes sure he has good people around him where he can bounce things ideas players and, and things off of and i think that's that's a big reason he, he's done so well i want to get your opinion on there are a lot of talk about the, the the playoff format you know the the whole in your division and things like that versus one versus eight one sixteen what are your thoughts there i i really would like to see us go back to one eight and two seven I, i'd like us to go back to that but uh, i understand what they're doing right now but i i'd like to see I'd like to see a better reward for the first place team. And I, I don't think, I don't believe they're rewarded enough uh, in, that, in that manner. That's, that's my opinion. You play 82 games to get it to a certain spot. And I, I mean, that's where I think, I don't think it's ever going to change, but, and a lot of that is out of everybody's, everybody's hands. Um, I do want to touch on, the firing of coaches in the NHL. <laughs> I mean, it just, it doesn't seem like it takes that much. And, you know, I look at the changes that happened in the off season where, you know, Monty, uh, obviously you probably worked with Monty was in St. Louis and he goes to Boston and you look at what they're doing there. And, and Cassidy goes to Vegas and look what they're doing there. And DeBoer leaves, where was he? San Jose or Vegas. And he comes to Dallas and look what they're doing there. Is it just the spike of a new guy coming in? Do they change that much? your thoughts on when these coaches leave and where they left, they were a good team and now they're a good team again. Is it just the voice? Do you think that the voice is the thing that, that the players need a change in why they start to play or what, what may it be? Irritability. It's the temperature gets dialed down when a new guy comes in. There's a lot of irritation on both sides 
they can feel the angst. The conversation starts being about the coach instead of competing. And once the conversation becomes about the, the coach rather than competing, then it's a slippery slope. And then a fresh voice comes in and now they've got to change their accountability and talk to each other. When the conversation inside the locker room gets to be about somebody outside the locker room, that's when the mangy crows take over and that's when you've got problems. So being able to keep it locked in the room, discuss it, good, bad, whatever, is really important. When it starts to get out, you know, the old conversation after the conversation is about the coach or a coaching or a coach. That's when bad things happen because that becomes a bigger part of the subject than competing and playing. And the other thing is, as a coach, Luds, it's really important that you you leave on great terms, as great a terms as you can, because th that general manager is the first guy they're going to call when they want to fire you. And you got to make sure that you've built a good relationship and you've kept it so you've kept it straight, so that um, you know. When I got let go in Dallas, it was heartbreaking. But the first call I get back is from Bob Ganey's best friend, Bob Clark, and and then I get a, and then he gets then Bob gets a call from Glenn Cedar. Those are the first two guys he calls, and um, you know, and then all of a sudden I got a job right away. And you know, it was because of the relationship that Bob and I had. Don't burn those those bridges, right? Yeah. Okay, so you, you mentioned coaches here. Um, my top coach in the NHL as of today is John Cooper. Uh, I know you've, you know, worked with Coop. And can can the guys like Daryl Sutter and, and, and Torts and guys like that, is there a place for them all the time? Or do they have to, knowing what you know now, do those guys have to change? The, or are they Probably they're never going to change, but would your advice if you're working with them you know they can be a little short and you know how you know how torts and setter go about their business you need great buffers if you're a volatile coach and an emotional coach you have to have great buffers what you mean assistant coaches yeah they got you got to know that these are guys that can put out the fires like like Rick and Doug put out a lot of fires for me yeah. and and you know I've, I've had a number of unbelievable uh, assistant coaches, Brad Shaw, Ray Bennett. Um, these guys have been, even Scott Mellenby, um, you know, one of my uh, just unbelievable amount of times that, you know, and I warned them, hey, this is coming, and they were ready for it. But they, I had great buffers, and I wanted people that challenged me. I wanted people that confronted me. If they thought I was out of line, they'd let me go. And... Uh, um, you got to have that. You got to hire that you got type of person that's willing to look you in the eye and say you're out of line or back off. Um, and if you do, you're going to last. If you don't, it's going to burn quick. So, and and that's the exact word I've used about Wills. My, I, I've always felt that he was an unbelievable buffer because you could you could light a fire and uh, under <laughs> under the you know the right guys, and and Wills was always that guy that could come in and kind of kind of sh schmooze it over. Can those coaches become head coaches, or is that what their strength is? Is the buffer? Because I, I look at Rick Bonus; he's been he's been in the league for forever, it seems like. And I think the knock on him for a, a long time was, you know, he's probably an assistant; he's better at that, and he has such a good relationship with players. And because you know the phrase that we've always used, and it hadn't happened a lot to me, where where an assistant becomes a head coach, the man has he changed. So you know, any advice to a guy? You know, Lambert in, in, in on the island now is, is you know, been a, a long-time assistant. Do these guys have to change a bit or, you know, to set their own ground? Or how do you look at that? L Luds, there's a huge difference between being a coach and being a teacher. And in, in order to be a coach, you have to be prepared sometimes to go on the island and be there by yourself. you got to be there where everybody's mad at you, everybody's pissed off at you, everybody hates your guts. And you're doing the right thing. You know what is right, and you're you're willing to stand your ground. And coaches that really coach, like you look, you talk to about John Cooper. Um, you know, you you got a series of of coaches here in in the National Hockey League. They're getting rotated a little bit now, but those guys are great coaches. Mike Sullivan, 
because they stand their ground and they're not afraid to take the criticism and they're not afraid to take the angst that comes with it. But that's what real coaching is, is people that are willing to stand up there and they know that the voice when they leave the room is not real happy, but they're willing to stay with it and, and see it out. Yeah, I, I, I listened to Coop and um, I watched the way he goes about his business. You know, you know, last, uh, what was it, a week ago, we sat down Point and Kucherov and uh, Stammer and he sat him down for a period. But when he comes out and talks about him, he has a way that because he, he knows players listen to the news. They, they the reporters come up to him. But, but, look, but look at him. Look at him. Look, look, look at the job he did in a very intense emotional situation, how he turned it into we. The whole conversation was turned into we. Not one conversation about I or about them. It was we. And that, to me, he, he diffused it right away. Yeah, and he, and, and he basically said, We're, we go the way these guys go. They're the best players on it. So we kind of patted him on the ass a little bit and then kind of kicked him in the ass a little bit. So it's easier to take, I think. And again, like you mentioned a long time ago, I, I just think a lot of coaching and, and dealing with players and maybe people in general is knowing who you're dealing with, what they can take, what they can't take, and you know how far you can push a button before you lose them. Yeah. And, and I always used to say to our group there in Dallas, we're better than this. Yeah. You know, like we're better than this. And, and I would say the same thing individually to a player, you know, you're better than this. This is not your A game. This is not the way you play when you play good. You know, we need you to be at the top of your game. And here's, here's what it looks like. Agreed. Uh, I want to leave with this, Hitch. Uh, where are you at with the teams in the NHL right now as we're getting close playoff time? Can you give me two teams in the West and two in the East? Well, for sure, Dallas, okay. number one. Are you saying I that because this we're, we're talking about this in Dallas? Or are you looking I, to get a job again? Yeah, I, th I think, they, I think they, they, got, they got the game, they got the elements, they got the personality that can can tear you down in a series. Do you, like, really the, do you like the tweaks that, that Jim Neal did at the end of the – did, did the did the Domi one surprise you at all? Kind of did for no. me, but just wondered. Well, I, I think they got so many workers there. They needed somebody that could score a little bit easier. And I think Jimmy's done a great job with that group there. And then the other one for me is Los Angeles. Okay. I, I think they're hiding in the weeds. And, you know, I think getting Corpusello is going to be a big difference for them. And they're, they're going to be a tough out. What happens when Vegas meets LA and, and quick as a net? I just think that. I think that there's a lot of beef on the bun in that LA team, and I, I like them. You know, and then, then the sleeper team for me is if Edmonton stays healthy, if they stay healthy, because they got just enough in every area, and they got the right attitude and the right disposition. If Edmonton just stays healthy and doesn't get banged up, you know, they got a couple of guys out now, but they they could sweep everybody because they've got so much firepower and they got so much youth on their side. But you know it gets thin after the original 20 players, whereas LA's got about 25 in the, in the kettle there. Okay. Where are you looking at in the East then? Boston, I'm assuming. Do you, do you, do you believe that Boston can, if healthy, can, can continue this? I think they can continue it. What worries me is that they're getting banged up and now the holes are coming out. Yeah. Uh, but I still think they're, I think, I think they'll get, every, hopefully they get everybody back. Um, that injury in Carolina is a That's real the hurt. They're, that that hurts them a lot. They yeah. get a couple of guys out. I, I don't really know. Um, I still think Tampa. Uh, I saw Tampa's game they played yesterday against New Jersey, and it was a great game and it was a heavy game. I still think it's going to be Tampa Boston. All right. Mr. Ken Hitchcock, I appreciate you taking time today away from your golf lessons and pickleball and whatever you and Ralphie got going on there. Hitch, you you basically have everything on your trophy yard, mantle, whatever you have there, and I know that there's one more call that will be made. I don't know how soon it's going to be made, but we all know it's going to be made, and so I appreciate you coming on here and it's enlightening. I, I, I learned, I, I ask a lot of questions because there's times I'm banging my head against the wall and I've, you've been nice enough to, <laughs> when, when you see my, my, my number come up on your phone, it's because I can't 
get to some players. And so I, I appreciate all the time you take with taking my stuff. And thanks for coming on this hitch. Buds, I really enjoyed it. You guys take care of yourselves. All right. Have a good day.